from Christian mythology, where Eve offered Adam the little apple and said, eat, to the world tree, Yggdrasil, to the Greek myth about the dryads who raised Zeus, plants have been pretty central to our mythology. And that is the topic of today's video. Welcome to another episode of Just in Time Worlds with Marie Mullaney. Today I'm going to discuss plants in a fantasy setting from a mythological perspective, from a plant type races and monsters perspective, and how you can use plants in your magic system. If you like this kind of world building content, please do hit the subscribe button down below if you haven't already. And if you like what I do on this channel and would like to support my work, please hit my Ko-fi page or buy my book, links to both down below. If you want to join the community of world builders of this channel, I do have a Discord server linked to that down below as well. Okay, let's get cracking with today's video. First, let's talk about the plants that we know. Plants are actually a fascinating organism. Did you know that plants absolutely know which way is up and down? They have sensors in their roots that can detect the downward force of gravity, and they have sensors in their leaves that can detect where the sun is. I think this is called pro preoception. I hope I have pronounced that correctly. I am not a biologist. So plants have got a very deep sense of gravity. That to me says that if you have a science fiction setting where you're playing with gravitational forces and the manipulation of gravity through something like a particle of gravity that you could call a graviton or something like that, you could have a plant-based race that learned to do this through evolution. They naturally manipulate gravity all around them. And through that, they achieve a near magical effect, except it's partially scientific. I think that that would be a really interesting science fantasy aspect if you lent into that ability of plants and the relationship that they have with gravity. The other thing that plants do that we have all observed, I'm sure, is that plants bend towards the light. If you cut off the tip of a plant, it doesn't continue to grow there. It'll put out a new shoot elsewhere on the stem. And that is because plants know where the light is and they grow towards the light because the light is their form of energy. Again, this would be an interesting thing to lean into from a science fantasy perspective, where you could have a plant-based race that developed the ability not just to bend towards the light, but eventually the ability to manipulate the light. Such a plant-based race would lean heavily into illusion because light is a great mechanic for creating illusions, right? If you can bend the light you can create yourself to be invisible because you can bend the light around yourself. Or you can create the illusion of something existing by means of bending the light into shaping it. So I think that you could make a fantastic monster or even sentient race based around this property of plants where in our world they bend towards the light. What if in your world they bent the light towards them. The other amazing thing about plants is how they communicate. Plants communicate by means of chemicals. They can't smell the way we do, but they can feel chemicals in the air and they can exude chemicals to communicate certain things. As an example of this, if, say, a worm starts attacking the lower levels of a plant, it will excrete a toxic substance in the upper levels of its leaves so that the worm will be turned away from exploring deeper into the plant. In essence, it sacrifices its lower leaves to this worm that is attacking it and it makes its upper reaches less tasty to the worm. Some plants even excrete a nectar when they are attacked by a worm. That nectar is not for the worm. It is to attract 
insects that find that worm to be a tasty treat. So the plant literally puts out pheromones to call in predators to deal with its worm problem on the lower levels. And that is such a cool mechanic. Your plant-based race could communicate all in chemicals, which makes them amazingly different weird. And the writing behind that would be so interesting. You could also have symbiotic relationships with insect races or insect monsters where the plants call insects to them whenever they're attacked. Because remember, plants are largely stationary. They're not walking around. So you could have an almost god race of plants that call for the defense of their insect race. That would be such a fascinating world to build because you have these deities that communicate with each other and the world around them with chemicals. And then you have the normal race of insect people that interact with their deities, defending them from the vile worms that are attacking their roots in a kind of call back to Yggdrasil and the worms that are eating at its roots. Hit the thumbs up button if you think that that would be a fun world to write about and to explore. Now, I just said that plants don't really move. And that is true in terms of plants being rooted in the earth and their roots being a core part of what they are and therefore them not moving. But plants do move their leaves and not always slowly. The Venus flytrap, the carnivorous plants, move quite rapidly. Their mouths can close quite fast, the pitcher plant as well. And what's really interesting is that the Venus flytrap, as an example, has got four senses inside of its little leaf, right? And it doesn't close that leaf unless the sensors tell it that they have been touched multiple times in quick succession. This is to prevent the leaf closing on an empty shell because the leaf can only open and close so many times. And while it closes fast, it takes 48 hours for it to open. So your Venus flytrap needs to be sure that it's closing on an actual fly and not on an empty space. So plants are actually capable of counting and of sensing the world around them. They're deaf and they're blind, but they are very touch sensitive. And of course, we just discussed how they can use chemicals in both communicating and in manipulating the space around them. So plants can sense the world around them. They can manipulate the world around them and communicate via chemicals and they can move quickly in some cases. And all of those should give you some great starting points for using plants in your world, both as monsters and as potential sentient races. So if you enjoyed that exploration of natural plants and how one can expand on their natural abilities, hit the thumbs up button. And let's discuss some more fantastical elements. Now, as I said, Plants have featured in a lot of our mythological content. Specifically, druids and dryads have both come a long way in our myths. Zeus was supposedly raised by the Melia, who were ash dryads, as in dryads who lived in ash trees. Now, the principle behind a dryad is that it is a fairy-type creature that lives inside a tree. The dryad has an intense relationship with the tree. The tree is both its home, sometimes its parent, sometimes the dryad is the tree and they can move around together. Dryads are a lot of fun to use if you plan on having a fairy style world because they are familiar to us from a mythological perspective. So you don't have to spend too much time describing how they work. Anybody who's familiar with various myths will go, oh, a dryad. OK, I know more or less how that works. And so you can just focus on describing the elements that make the dryad different. That's why dryads are such a staple of urban fantasy. And in fact, Rick Royerden 
uses the specific Melia dryads, the ash dryads, in his Trials of Apollo series where Meg revives the ash dryads and they serve as warriors for Meg and Apollo in their fight against the evil emperors. Rick Royerden had these dryads running around as well as being in their trees, right? But once the trees have taken root, that's it, they're no longer moving. Terry Brooks went a different way with his Magic Kingdom for Sale sold, the Landover books. Queen Willow has to periodically turn into a tree. Now, she's a dryad as well, but she can move around freely. She looks like a woman with a slightly greenish skin and with slightly wooden hair, but she can walk around, talk, do all the human things, except that every now and again she has to turn back into a tree and spend some time, you know, refreshing her roots and so on. What makes that a very interesting mechanic, if you think about it, is now you've got this person who plants themselves at the edge of a river and then their, like, roots extend into the river and they spend some time there as a willow tree or in the forest as an oak tree or whatever. And then they're like, okay, done now, and they pull up their roots and, you know, walk away as a human. But doesn't that leave an awful lot of holes dotted across your landscape as you've got these magical shape changers that are running around the countryside, putting down roots and lifting themselves up and changing into humans and changing into plants and so on. Anyway, random thoughts. The point is that with dryads, you could go with they live in a tree or you could go with they are a tree sometimes. Of course, Tolkien brought us the tree ants. And you had to know when I started this video that I would be talking about tree ants. So besides the fact that tree ants are giant creatures that are related to plants and that act as tree herders, there are some very interesting themes that Tolkien addresses by means of tree ants. Trolls are a mockery of tree ants. Tolkien makes the theme continuously that evil cannot create, it can only mock. And so the trolls are the bad side of tree ants, which is a very interesting mythological concept to explore. If there are good tree ants, what are the bad things called? And in Tolkien's case, they're trolls. It's also interesting that tree ants speak very slowly. Tree ants generally move very slowly until they don't. This, of course, calls back to plants being slow. Plants don't grow overnight. They don't just spring up around them. And plants can't easily move. But when they do move, it is dramatic. When the tree ants do besiege Isengard, it falls quite rapidly. This, to me, is a callback to nature doesn't act fast. It takes a long time for things to build up to a critical mass in the natural world. It doesn't just change overnight. We humans, we change quite fast, especially in the last century with all the technological changes. Our technology has exploded and our world has changed very fast. But the natural world changes very slowly. But that doesn't mean that that change cannot suddenly be dramatic and accelerated and truly terrifying. When the volcano went up in the Pacific Ocean, I was very much reminded that we actually do just live on this planet. <laughs> there is an awesome power in the natural world that we have no control over. And to me, Tolkien's Ents kind of represent that power of nature that is very slow to move, but when it does, it can be terrifying and awe-inspiring all at the same time. Not that I am personifying nature at all. Please don't misunderstand me here. I'm just referring to how its effects look. And if you like that discussion of Tolkien's tree ends and what they thematically mean to me, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about how to use plants in your magic system. Now here I am going to lean into Harry Potter because J.K. Rowling really did a good job in using plants in her magic system. First, you have a whole series of monstrous plants, the Devil's Snare, which 
of course, is susceptible to sunlight, which you need to relax or it keeps tightening around you and which is used in book one to defend the philosopher's stone. Then there's the Whomping Willow, which is planted to defend the entrance to the Shrieking Shack and which has that knot on it that prevents it from being a Whomping Willow that reduces its its Whompingness, which is a very interesting defensive mechanism to engage to protect a fixed location. Again, remember, plants don't move a lot. So if you're going to use a plant to defend a location, it needs to be a reasonably stationary location, a place which can be defended by something that is stationary. Then there's the use of plants as utilities magic. And this is well illustrated by Harry eating gillyweed in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So in this book, Harry has to spend some time underwater. So he eats this plant called gillyweed. And not only does it enable him to breathe underwater by giving him gill slits in his neck, but it also lengthens his hands and puts webbing between his fingers and lengthens his feet and puts webbing between his toes, which of course allows him to swim better. Essentially, gillyweed turns him into a underwater dweller. It is a great piece of utility magic that you can eat this plant and turn into a fish. Then there's the use of plants in potion making. And this is beautifully illustrated, of course, by the mandrakes in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, where mandrakes are used to create the anti-petrification potion that will wake up the people who were petrified by the basilisk, by the, the monster in the tunnels that is unleashed by Slytherin's air. Now, what is fascinating about the mandrakes is that their cry kills, so you have to repot them very carefully with these huge earmuffs on. It makes them a very memorable plant, which makes you very much remember that mandrakes go into potions, and these potions are used in anti-petrification. So plants offer you a great deal of versatility in your magic system. You can use them as utility eating magic, so something that does something to you when you eat them. You can use them as ingredients to potions. You can use them to defend fixed locations. You could even use them as a source of magic. So you eat a plant and this then allows you to use magic. In a fantasy world, you have a lot of options for using plants to make your magic system rich and engaging to readers of your world. Now, you could argue that I should, in this video, talk about orcs from Warhammer 40k in terms of a sentient race of plants. But I'm not going to, because orcs are technically fungi. So if you would like me to do another video on how to bring fungi into your fantasy world and, and what they offer you as a world builder, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, you will probably enjoy my video on consumption magic and my video on insects and how to use them in a fantasy world. Please do hit the thumbs up button on this video if you enjoyed it and I will see you soon for another video.